morning and welcome to class. Thank you, Lubega, Jafina, John Paul, and Zelotoli for joining class this morning. Uh, we'll begin, uh, we'll continue our study on Romans chapter 12. So uh, we'll start studying verses 9 following. So before we do that, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Jafina. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. May we learn more about you, more about who we are in you, Jesus. But I just pray that every truth that we learn will just apply it in our life and it will it will be planted in our heart that we will see the harvest of the word in our life, Jesus. We believe that you are faithful to your words. Let every word that we learn uh, stay in our mind. Uh, help us to live this life in much more better way. My classmates, God, you have to come. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. Uh, we lost you in between. I don't know whether my internet connection was bad or the others as well didn't hear Jeffina. But anyways, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we began studying chapter uh, 12 on Monday and uh, chapter 12 uh, Paul is writing to the church at Rome more about practical ways of living their Christian life. And so he's telling the believers um, that, you know, um, uh, he, he begins by saying that they have to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, which is holy, pleasing and acceptable to God, which is their spiritual uh, sacrifice, spiritual worship unto the Lord. And then he's... Um, he goes on to talk about how they need to renew their minds um, and serve in, and uh, also about uh, you know uh, how they can serve in the body of Christ. So he says that uh, you know even as each one of them have been given one or more functions uh, in the body of Christ, uh, they also have uh, the specific gifts uh, to fulfill that function. God's given them specific gifts to fulfill that function. And every believer has been given the grace from God uh, and, the, uh, and the gifts uh, that they require to serve and fulfill that function that God has called them uh, to. So in verses 9 following, uh, the focus is more on uh, relationship with others in the body of Christ. Um, uh, what? How do we relate to others? Uh, outside the body of Christ and also within uh, the body of Christ. So he's basically talking about uh, the relationship uh, aspect with people outside and inside the body of Christ. Okay, so we look at uh, verses uh, 9 following. So can somebody read verses 9 to verse um, uh, 16, please? Can somebody read verses 9 to verse 16? Uh, am I audible, Pastor? Yes. Yeah. Romans chapter 12, right? Yes. Verses 9 Romans to Romans chapter 12. Yeah. Verses 9 to 16. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Amen. 
Thank you, uh, Jafina. So, uh, verse 9, uh, Paul says, you know, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. So he's saying, first of all, you know, uh, of the uh, of all the virtues, first of all, Paul addresses is love. And he says, you know, we need to be genuine in our love, which means uh, don't pretend uh, to, uh, to love people, be genuine in your love to others, you know, and your love must be heartfelt, it must be genuine care and genuine help that you want to offer people. Verse 10, it says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in order giving preference to one another. So it says the way we express kindness and genuine love is by giving preference uh, to uh, one another. So in ministry, you know, um, we think that, you know, if God uses us mightily or, uh, you know, we're very gifted in a specific um, a function that God has called us to. We have uh, immense grace. The grace of God just is overpowering us, empowering us, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, when God is using us mightily, we feel entitled. We feel, uh, you know, uh, we need to be given uh, preference. So if there are, uh, you know, if we are good at worship and if there are two, two or three other worship leaders, then you feel entitled that you need to be given uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the responsibility to be the worship pastor, the worship leader, or for that specific conference, or, uh, you know, for that specific uh, um, uh, program that you're having in church, a conference, you have to, you know, lead the worship on all the days. Uh, so you feel entitled to that. Or, you know, if you are a preacher and you're, you know, very powerful, anointed preacher, charismatic, and people just, you know, you have the charisma in you and people just, uh, you know, um, uh, easily uh, are just so uh, caught up with your preaching and your teaching, and it's so powerful, your teaching, preaching is just so anointed by God. Uh, you feel that, you know, you should be given the preferences over other people, over other pastors, over other ministers, um, when it comes to uh, you know special conferences or meetings um, or whatever because you are uh, you know greatly anointed or you're a better preacher uh, so paul is saying uh, hey you know we need to come to a place where uh, you know uh, in honor where we are giving preference to others which means we're giving a chance to others that and that should be our attitude our attitude is not that we be uh, prominent we be seen but we give a place to others as well okay verse 11 he says not lagging in diligence but being fervent in spirit and serving uh, the Lord. Be diligent means not being sluggish or lethargic, uh, slow, uh, you know, uh, lazy, idle, sluggish or inactive. Uh, but, you know, he's saying be uh, fervent in the spirit. That means be on fire, you know, be full of fire, uh, be zealous, be enthusiastic, be, uh, be passionate and uh, not lacking in uh, zeal. Okay, so that is how we need to serve the Lord, not being, you know, slow and lethargic and sluggish and lazy uh, or inactive, but just being fervent and excited and enthusiastic and passionate uh, in what God has called us to do. And then in verse 12, he says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. So he's saying, uh, rejoice in hope. Because he's, he's already spoken about, you know, hope of the glory that we will receive, the future hope, you know, that all of creation will be redeemed. We also, even though we are partly um, enjoying uh, the fruit of eternal life, we would experience in fullness and we have that hope in the future. So he's talked about the hope of the glory that we will receive, that we will see, that we will uh, uh, that we will experience, that we are experiencing partially in part, and also, you know, the hope of creation being restored, and all of that he's spoken about it, but he's saying, you know, rejoice in that hope, which means he's saying, hey, now I know you are going through tribulation, because you know, the church at Rome was facing a lot of uh, difficulties, persecutions, tribulations, um, 
uh, it was um, it was more than just you know what we can think of and how Nero was persecuting the Christians you know how he was treating them how he was what he's making of them uh, so he's saying you know even in that situations be patient you know uh, why is he saying be patient because there is hope you know there is uh, an eternal hope that we have and so because of that uh, eternal hope that you have and the hope that you have now in the present rejoice and he's saying even as you go through these hardships you know uh, rejoice in the hope that you have and also be consistent in prayer that is what is going to take you through uh, patiently in tribulation and rejoicing in the hope because prayer is something that would um, open our spiritual eyes to the things that God has for us, in store for us, and the peace and the, and the covering and the grace and the strength that we would uh, receive uh, through prayer, okay? Verse 13, he says, distributing to the needs of the saints given, given to hospitality. So he says, bless others, uh, give to the needs of others, be generous and uh, kind, okay? And then verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. So he says, don't retaliate when people persecute you because the church at Rome was going through persecutions and accusations. And uh, so he's saying, don't retaliate, you know, when people persecute you, bless them. And um, uh, just like the Lord Jesus taught us to pray and to bless our persecutors in Matthew chapter 4, verse 44, he says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Okay, so that is what uh, Jesus has taught us. He's taught us to love our enemies, bless those who curse us and do good to those who uh, hate us so he's saying don't retaliate bless and do not curse because they were in that situation you know which was very very difficult for the church at rome the christians so that is why paul is writing uh, to them and also in this present situation which we are in you know or we'll find ourselves soon in where we will face persecutions and difficulties and hardships you know we are called to bless those who persecute us and not uh, curse them okay verse 15 says rejoice with those who rejoice weep with those who weep okay so it means that you know basically uh, be part of every aspect of people's lives which means he's saying you know he he's told us in verse 9 like you know uh, love people genuinely you know uh, don't be uh, you know um, uh, without hypocrisy but the genuine love you know love others with a heart that is you know love must be heartfelt and the way you care and help people what he's talking about in verse 9 uh, he's saying here that you know uh, uh, be so much part of people's life that the way you care for them and you help them, uh, you know, uh, means that you are part of every area of their life. So when they rejoice, rejoice with them. When they weep, you weep with them. When they moan, you moan with them. When they're sorrowful, you know, you help them out, uh, encourage them, strengthen them, and build them up. Okay. Verse 16 says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So he says, be willing to associate and think with people of different levels. You know, at times we will have to relate with people who are in higher level, uh, places of high influential authority, uh, the rich, uh, the intellectuals. You know, so, you know, when we relate with them, you relate with them in their level, you know, and sometimes we're called to relate with people who are simple, lowly, uh, the poor, you know, we need to learn to relate to them in their uh, uh, situation or in their level. So as God's people, he says, we need to work and we need to learn to relate with people at all levels of all status of society, of all spheres, of all uh, places of position or levels uh, that people are in society. And he says this is how we can fulfill the command uh, to be of the same mind toward one another. And it's a simple command. You know, what is the command is to be considerate uh, to the feelings of others, 
uh, you know, instead of waiting for uh, on them to be considerate towards your feelings, you need to be considerate towards their uh, feelings. So when we do that, so we fulfill the command of being of the same mind toward one another. Okay, if you look at this verse, uh, uh, how it's rendered in the uh, ESV, the English Standard Version, it says, "Live in harmony with one another." Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. So in this verse, in um, verse 16, you know, uh, there are three injunctions uh, here, okay? Uh, three uh, orders or rules or sanctions. The first one is be of the same mind. Means he says, be of one mind, uh, live in harmony, uh, get along with one another. And he says, be of a humble mind, which means don't be high-minded, you know, be willing to associate with the lowly. And then he says, be of a true mind, which means he's saying, have a proper opinion of yourself. You know, uh, when we don't have a proper opinion of ourselves, uh, we begin to think that we are wise in our own ways and, uh, you know, we can become self-deceived. Okay, so Paul is basically addressing an issue here of how we think. You know, he's talked about a renewed mind, and so he's think, saying that we need to think out of that renewed mind. So a renewed mind is able to think this, be of the same mind in unity and, and harmony with one another. A renewed mind is a humble mind, and a renewed mind is a true mind, which is able to think uh, thoughts that are true, uh, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is noble, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, the word of God says, think about such things. So, you know, so he's saying, you know, a renewed mind is able to think through uh, thoughts and have a true mind. Okay. So um, he's talked about this in um, the opening verse, in, in, in the in verse two of this chapter, but he's talking about this uh, again. So we're looking at the backward view and the forward view. Okay. So in Galatians chapter six and three, it says, "For anyone who thinks himself to be something when he's not, uh, when he's nothing, he deceives him uh, self." Okay, so like we said, a true mind is someone who has a proper opinion of themselves. And if you don't have a proper opinion of yourselves, you think more highly than you ought to think about yourself. You know, you come to a place of self-deception or you or you become self-deceived. And self-deception -de uh, is a very dangerous place to be in because self-deception leads to pride you know we know that uh, lucifer was filled with pride we read about this in first timothy chapter 3 verse 6 and it says uh, you know how did uh, pride enter lucifer uh, it was because uh, or it was through self deception he thought of himself more highly than he should have thought about himself as we read in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. So, you know, when we are drawn away by our own desires, uh, you know, we can, we become self-deceived. That's what we read in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 16, you know. And um, Lucifer, you know, what was his desire? He desired to be something that he was not, or he desired for something that belonged only to God, uh, you know, only worship was only to God. He desired that to be worshipped. And so he became self-deceived that he could have it. And that brought him to a place of pride and pride brought his downfall. Okay. So it's very uh, important for us, you know, to be of a true mind, which goes back to having a renewed um, mind because if we don't have a true mind uh, we become wise in our own selves we become self-deceived okay verse 17 um we didn't read verse 17 right okay uh, any any questions so far till verse 16 Any questions? Uh, I just have a little question. When it says uh, weep with uh, those who weep, 
what does it basically yes. uh, mean? It means that when uh, those who are mourning or grieving for their loved ones, you know, we stand along with them, we uh, comfort them, we console them, we be part of their mourning and weeping. So sometimes when, you know, people lose their loved ones and we are very close to them, we also, you know, feel their brokenness, we feel their grief. Uh, also could be when people are going through brokenness and pain, um, and, you know, a mourning or, uh, you know, going through uh, loss, you know, we just stand beside them, we stand along with them, we feel their pain, their burden, we carry their pain and burden, uh, and we minister to them, we encourage them, we strengthen them, and we offer uh, whatever help we can uh, in their time of mourning and loss and, uh, you know, in their brokenness and in their pain. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if not, if can somebody read uh, verses 17 till the end of the chapter, verse 21, please? Romans chapter 12, verses 17 to 21. Can somebody read that, please? Yes. Romans verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Thank you, uh, Rosalind. So verse um, 17, Paul says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. So he says, you know, we must be careful to do things that are good in the sight of all men. So whether it's believers or non-believers, he says, when 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 anyone looks at us, they must see that, you know, what we are doing is uh, we're doing things that are good. And no one should point an accusing finger uh, towards us. And we need to be blameless in the sight of uh, those in the church, the believers and those outside uh, the church. So he says, whatever you do, do it in a way that is beyond reproach. Verse 18, if it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So he's saying, you know, uh, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men, which means he's saying that, hey, I understand. You know, it implies that, hey, I understand that, you know, there can be some situations where um, having a peaceful and harmonious uh, relationship with people uh, may not be possible. Uh, and, you know, sometimes in some human relationships, things might be difficult, can, things can be, go outside our control. We can't control people's attitudes, wills, emotions, mindsets, their behavior. But he's saying that uh, as far as it's possible, how much ever you can do, you know, um, uh, live peace, peacefully with all men. Uh, but, you know, there are times when even when we want to uh, live peacefully with all people, they want to fight with us, they want to argue with us and accuse us. Uh, well, at those times, what do we do? You know, we are not responsible for people's actions, their reactions, their, uh, you know, their immaturity or their inability to handle difficult situations. But even in those situations, we just, you know, choose peace. If we either don't retaliate, we don't argue, we don't answer back, we don't accuse, uh, we just let go, okay? And he's saying, uh, you know, uh, why should you live peacefully? How can you let go? Because he knows the situation that the people in Rome are, you know, the way they are being treated, the way they're being persecuted, the way they're being burned, the way they are being beaten and, you know, made of sport of. 
you know, it's difficult for them to not retaliate. It's difficult for them to live peacefully with the, uh, you know, the Roman citizens, the, 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 uh, the unbelievers. Uh, but, you know, how can, you know, uh, we live peacefully as far as it's possible? And so he goes on to say, you know, uh, don't avenge yourself, but rather give place to uh, wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So he he's quickly saying that, you know, why should you live, try to your best to live peacefully, even if situations do not allow you to be peaceful, he's saying, you know, uh, he basically is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35, where he's saying, you know, um, uh, don't, uh, 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 you know, where, where it's written, vengeance, God says, vengeance is mine, I will um, repay. So, you know, he's saying, Paul is saying, don't take revenge, uh, don't try to get justice uh, done for yourself, but leave it to God. Let God uh, vindicate you. You know, give your case to God. Rest your case uh, with um, God. So even when we are wrongfully treated or oppressed, you know, we must look to God and be assured that He will, uh, you know, execute righteousness and uh, justice on our behalf. Uh, that is what even Jesus did, right? He did not uh, retaliate. Uh, he did not um, uh, fight back. You know, he just uh, w let go and he he looked uh, up to the uh, for God's wrath and his vengeance or his justice to be done uh, in his uh, case. Okay, so you know we have to live beyond reproach. Okay, that's what even Christ uh, did. Okay, so um, uh, instead of fighting our case, instead of, uh, you know, getting justice for ourselves, we need to just leave the justice and righteousness for God to bring about righteousness and justice in our case. Instead, what we need to do is we need to focus on what God has called us to do, and that is to bless people, which is very difficult uh, for us to do, but Paul is already laid the basis, he's already laid the foundation for what he's, for all the difficult things he's asking them to do. And he's saying that, hey, if you have a renewed mind, well, this is what you will do. If you are willing to offer your bodies as a living sacrifices, living sacrifice daily, uh, as a worship to God, this is what you will do. You will live peacefully, even if it's not possible. You will not take revenge or vengeance or you not fight your case you leave it to god even when you are in a position you, you can do it you leave it to god why because you know you already are in a place where um you are offered up your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing and acceptable to god this is your acceptable or pleasing worship to god so this is how you will behave. And then he says, in the renewed mind, this is how you will behave. So, you know, Paul is actually, if you look at uh, his, the way he writes, very smart, very intelligent. Um, the way he's so structured in his writing and his, his arguments and the way he brings in his arguments and tries, uh, gives uh, a, 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 a strong basis and a foundation so that nobody can, you know, retaliate and question back uh, because it's all just, you know, strongly based and strongly founded. And then he builds on that. He says that. So even in you, we look at it, you know, it's it's difficult when, uh, you know, when we uh, we we, get, uh, we should keep quiet and how long should we keep quiet? How long should we, you know, um, uh, put up with all of these things? Um, but if we, as people who are offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, as a worship to God, and we're living out of a renewed mind, you know, this is what we should be doing. This is, should be our lifestyle, our culture, and this is how we should live, okay? And uh, Psalm 103, verse 6 says, The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Okay, so the Lord will bring about righteousness. He will bring about justice for those who are uh, oppressed. Okay, verse 20 says, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his uh, head. Okay, so 
uh, in verse 20, he's saying, since you have rested your case with God, you've, you know, giving your case to God and saying, God, you bring about justice, you bring about righteousness in my case, then when you rest your case with God, now, uh, you know, do good to those who are uh, harming you, you know, and he says, feed them, if they're thirsty, give them a drink, you know, and then he is basically quoting here from Proverbs chapter 25 verses 21 and 22 where he says if your enemy is hungry feed him if he's thirsty give him a drink for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his uh, head but uh, you know um, Paul leaves out the last part uh, 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 in this verse in which is in Proverbs he says and the Lord will reward you so you know uh, he leaves out this part which is there in the Old Testament uh, because this could, you know, this is what something he already has addressed in verse 19, which means when you rest your case with God, God will reward you by executing uh, justice or bringing about righteousness on your behalf or in your case. And then he ends this whole chapter, uh, you know, verse 21. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good so he's saying you know this should be like a default response you know a response that uh, is automatic that is something that is routine that is part of just our culture our lifestyle as as uh, kingdom citizens uh, and you know as people who are living with a renewed mind people who are offered their bodies a living sacrifice he says you know do not be overcome by evil uh, which means don't let evil defeat you okay so evil refers to anything uh, that is worthless that is uh, uh, harmful injurious that is depraved you know he says don't let any such thing subdue you or overpower you you know or, uh, or bring you under its control or its influence okay instead he says when faced with anything that is evil, which is worthless, which is harmful, injurious, you know, is depraved. Uh, you have to conquer it. And how do you conquer it? It with good. So when someone is hurtful, you know, he's uh, basically a renewed mind will think how we can bless them and not just think, but do it. Okay. And when someone is unfair, a renewed mind will think how you can show them mercy and kindness and not just think about it, but also do it. Okay. So we see how beautifully he lays the foundation in the first two verses in chapter 12 about Christian living and then how he builds on it. Because all of what he's saying later on in verses 9 following verse 2, verse 21 is extremely challenging and difficult for the church at Rome. But he's saying, you know, do this because of um, who you are. You are uh, people who have offered your body's living sacrifice. That's your worship to God and as a renewed mind. And when you do that, automatically, this will become your culture, your lifestyle as kingdom citizens. Okay. So that was chapter 12 for us. Any questions on chapter 12? No questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then uh, we'll move on to chapter 13. Okay, so can, uh, I think chapter 13 has uh, 14 verses, I think. So can we begin reading chapter 13, please? So each of you can be, maybe read uh, uh, four or five verses. So can we begin reading chapter 13? Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 5. Let every soul be subject to the government, uh, governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist, exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. 
For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Thank you, Zeratoli. Uh, can somebody read verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, please? For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, <coughs> fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witnesses, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love doesn't harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Amen. Thank you, Subhashis. And somebody can read uh, verses 11 to verse 14, please. We do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far, pre far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Amen. Thank you, uh, John Paul. So in chapter 13, who do you think uh, Paul is talking about? What is the main point of discussion? Or what, who is he writing about? Any thoughts? You can unmute your mics and speak, or you can even type in the chat. So who is Paul talking about in chapter 13? Referring to in chapter 13. The discussion is about what? It's about the government. Yes, thank you, Paul. Uh, good to hear your voice. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so in Romans chapter 13, you know, uh, basically has to do with how to relate to uh, the civic government or civic or the government authorities. Uh, other than First Peter chapter 2, this is the primary place in the New Testament where there is teaching on uh, civic authorities. Um, I think even Paul writes to Timothy as well. You know, there is a little mention about... Uh, uh, government that he talks about there uh, uh, to Timothy uh, uh, when he writes to uh, Timothy. Okay, uh, so we know that uh, Paul is writing to the believers at Rome, and Rome was ruled by uh, the Roman Empire, who was in control, and the Roman em emperors were uh, godly. Uh, uh, sorry, were. Uh, ungodly people uh, and they were very very terrible they were known for their treacherous acts uh, inhuman treacherous acts and um, you know Nero was in power when Paul was writing this letter and he was an extremely uh, wicked man um, and he was so much against the Christians and so harsh, so inhuman towards them that he even used them as uh, torches to light his uh, garden. And he also used them as entertainment, making a sport of them, throwing them in the arena where 
know, they'll have this uh, uh, ravenous beast, hungry lions, and, uh, you know, animals come and, you know, make us, and it was like a sporting game uh, for the people to enjoy. And we see that, you know, eventually even Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman emp uh, uh, Empire um, around AD 70, okay? So the Roman government were not uh, kind people, they're not godly, they were not fair, they were not just. So uh, for Paul to write these words to believers uh, at Rome is quite astounding. Uh, it's not Paul writing, uh, it is the words of God, it's the Holy Spirit imparting to Paul. And hence, you know, even as we study it today and we read it today, we need to uh, take it very seriously and we have to apply it in our own uh, day and time. So verse 1, he says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So he says, you know, submit to the civic authorities and, you know, no questions asked, you know. Uh, so can we submit to a good government? If it's a bad government, we don't submit to them. What if the leader is uh, inhuman, uh, you know, treacherous, rude, so we don't submit to him. So no questions asked. He says, you know, submit to or be subject to the governing uh, authorities. And... Um, he says, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And so the view that Paul brings to us is that, you know, those in governing authorities are appointed by God. And I think this was something that church at Rome could be quite shocked to hear or read when, you know, when his letter was being read that, hey, you know, how can you say Nero was somebody who was appointed by God? Okay, but that's what uh, the Holy Spirit reveals to Paul, and that's what he's writing. In verse 2, he says, Therefore, uh, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So he's here, he's becoming a little more, you know, firm in what he's saying. He's saying that, you know, uh, those of you who resist the ordinance of God, ordinance means the institution of God. Because in verse 4 and verse 6, he notice how he refers to uh, the civic authorities or the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the government. Uh, he calls them as God's ministers. This is something, again, would be very shocking for the, the believers at Rome that he's calling those in civic authorities, calling those in, uh, in government, in, 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 in authority, in position. He's calling them as ministers of God. So Paul mentions to us that the civic government uh, are appointed by God, which is something which is too much for the church at Rome to take. And then he says it's an institution of God. And then he says that they are God's ministers. Okay. So Paul is basically saying that they are, they are instru uh, instruments in God's hands. So he's saying, regardless of the form of government, whether it is a monarchy uh, or whether it is democratic or whether it is a dictatorship kind of a government, you know, uh, whatever kind of government, no qualifiers, you know, he mentions no qualifiers here. Uh, and it's, he says, and it's also wrong for us to put uh, qualifiers. He says, whatever form of government, uh, uh, is there in place, we need to view them as appointed by God. You know, they are, the, uh, they are the institution of God and they are God's ministers. So sometimes as Christians in our present day and age, we can say, hey, you know, we have, we don't have a democratic kind of a government. We have a dictation, dictatorship kind of government. So I'm not going to, you know, obey or be subject or come under this government um, you know, or I'm just going to follow a monarchy government because that is what this was in the Old Testament. God is king and, you know, so I'm going to follow that kind of a government, not democratic, not dictatorship. But we can't, uh, you know, have our own uh, qualifiers to whom we're going to submit to and who we are going to adhere to. But he says, who, irrespective of the kind of government authorities, you know, he says, uh, we need to be subject to them. We need to submit to them. So, 
uh, even as these governments have been appointed by God, they're the institution of God, they're God's ministers. As believers, what should we do? In verse 1, Paul says we need to be subject to them. And in verse 2, he says don't resist them. That means don't oppose them, don't fight against them. And verse 3, he says do what is good. And verse 7, he says render, render therefore to all their due money, and respect and honor, which is something more difficult for uh, the the Christians, okay, and even the Jews, okay. So, first of all, the Jews would not be subject to the Roman government; they would resist them, fight against them, and then you know not even pay their taxes or respect them and honor them because they think the respect and honor is only due to God. But here, Paul is saying. You know, we need to give them all their dues in terms of the taxes that we have to pay and also respect and honor. Okay. So, verse 3. Okay. Verse 3 uh, to verse 8, you know, uh, uh, he says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? If you want to be unafraid of the authority, then do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he's God's minister to you for good. So he's referring to the government as God's minister. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For if for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So he's talked about a great deal about conscience in chapter 1. Okay, so he's, um, and also in the other chapters, and so he's talking about for conscience sake here, he says, well, because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. So you look at how many times he's, he's again and again and again referring to them as God minister, God's ministers, three times here, okay, in, um, in verse 4, in verse um, uh twice in, uh, in, in verse 4 and also in verse 6. And then he says, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And he says, Oh, no one excepting love one another, for he who loves uh, another has fulfilled the law of, uh, 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 fulfilled the law. Okay. So even as we look at these uh, scripture passages. You know, let's consider some questions uh, with regard to governing authorities. So, in what sense are governing authorities appointed by God? What about unjust, corrupt, and wicked leaders? So, uh, we can ask this question Are wicked rulers also appointed by God? Are rulers who, you know, close their eyes or uh, overlook uh, good? You know, or these evil, so-called evil rulers who do what is unjust, uh, rulers who persecute Christians, are, are they also appointed by God? You know, um, now we see throughout history that there have been different kind of leaders. We've had kings, rulers, civic leaders, etc. You know, some good, some very uh, wicked, some moderate, you know. But from scripture, we understand, uh, you know, a few things. The first thing is that God has instituted governmental authority. We studied this in the kingdom of God, if you can remember, you know, that uh, we have all been placed under authority. Okay, and we need to recognize that, uh, you know, we have been placed under authoritative or governmental structures in each and every area of our life, whether it's in family, whether it's in the local church, or it's in the body of Christ, or it's in the workplace, or in the society. We all come under uh, 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 an authority, a governmental structure, and we recognize that all authority flows from God, and God has instituted authority structures through which his purposes are unfold on the earth, whether it's family, you know, uh, we saw that there is a governmental structure that God has ordained in the family, where the husband and wife, even though they are equal uh, in God's sight, they have equal access to the word of God, the gifts, the functions, to everything, you know, the love of God, everything, but yet in God's authoritative structure or God's government in the home, we see that man is the head. So also in the church, you know, 
all of us are saved by grace. We are all heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. And uh, we all have the right standing with God. We all are righteous. God loves us all the same, you know. But yet, in the church, in God's governmental structure and authority in the church, He has placed leaders, pastors who are in charge. Okay, and so we need to submit to the government, uh, God's authoritative structure, uh, or God's government in the local church or in the body of Christ. So also in the workplace, there is leadership. So also in our society that we live, there is a government. And that is God's governmental structure or God's authority that he has placed in the workplace and in the uh, society. So in every level, God has placed us in authority structures. And each of these authority structures are from God. And God has permitted these and instituted uh, them. Okay, um, And through this, God is fulfilling his plan and his purpose. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll continue in the next class. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? No questions. Okay, thank you all for uh, joining class. Have a blessed weekend and I'll see you on Monday and we'll continue studying about Romans chapter 13. Thank you, everyone.